So it's actually an unbiblical form of prayer, of invoking God's power. Let's talk about the mm-hmm. prayer because um, we we just had lunch together before we came here. And, and one of you, I can't remember which one of you said it, but it was so profound to me. Um, and that's that a lot of times when people come out of this movement, they don't know how to pray. Mm-hmm. And they, they feel really stunted in prayer because prayer is such a huge part of this movement. And it's a very specific theology of prayer. So I wonder if one of you could talk about that. Yeah, sure. well... Um, so so in this movement, it is taught that the type of prayer that is the most effective or powerful is is prayer declar- making prayer declaration. So, you know, what would that look so, like? Right. So so normally, traditionally, historically, what we think of when we think of Christians think of prayer is making humble request petitions, requests of God, asking him, you know, if it's your will, God, you yeah. please heal this person or or this or that. But um, with making prayer declarations, it's declaring that such and such will happen, declaring that a healing will occur, declaring that finances will come through for something. Or, and it's believed that the spoken word actually creates reality, much the way that, that God spoke in Genesis and, and created. And this is a word of faith teaching that has been incorporated into the new apostolic reformation. So it's seen as like this lost truth that was restored mm. through the word of faith movement. And then it's, it's part of NAR, a really pivotal part of NAR theology. And so the leaders in this movement go so far as to say that nothing happens without declarations being made. So there, even in the writings of, of leaders of this movement, um, like Bill Johnson, they'll say that even Christ's first coming, it only happened because prayer declarations were being made by like Simeon and Anna wow. and um, and that his second coming won't even occur in, until the church is making prayer declarations. And so literally nothing happens in the kingdom of God without be first there being prayer, prayer declarations that are being made. And um, Interestingly, though, they often just refer to it as prayer and what they mean is prayer declarations often. So like when this olive incident happened, you know, in, in the media and they were being criticized because major media picked up that story, large newspapers. And and they were saying things like we're just praying. We're just we're, we're just praying that it's, you know, and people are like, what's wrong with them praying to ask this little right. girl to be raised from the dead? Who could object to that? But they weren't just praying uh, like like Christians normally think of prayer. They weren't making requests of God. They were declaring that she would be raised from the dead. And that's a totally different thing. And so what you'll find in this movement is they often equivocate on terms mm. like prayer. Yeah. And that's one way this movement has been able to grow and gain so much influence mm. um, among unsuspecting Christians is because they'll use terms like prayer, but they've redefined it and given it a new meaning. In many cases, they're talking about making prayer declarations. Yeah, And so they're able to kind of uh, stay under the radar. Well, Doug, you're right. you're a philosophy professor, mm-hmm. so she just mentioned they're equivocating. Mm-hmm. Can you help our audience understand, like, what is the equivocation fallacy, and you know how how might that manifest in a in an example in this movement? Well, you can use you can equivocate in an argument and commit a fallacy, which is a mistaken reasoning. It's a crime against logic. Yeah. Uh, or you can equivocate just by switching up the way you're using terms without using them in an argument. So you might not be committing a fallacy just because you're equivocating. So in the simplest sense of the term, it just means that a word that is being, that is used with one sense in mind somehow switches during the course of conversation to have a different sense. And it might be that people, uh, parties to the discussion don't catch on to the switch. Mm. They don't notice the sleight of hand or the change in language or meaning of the same language. So here it's prayer. The, the key word is prayer. And so when we talk about prayer and we are prayerfully expecting God to respond to our desires for healing for someone, for example, we would call that petition, but we don't always use the word petition. Mm-hmm. Let's say we pray for that person. All right. Well, now in NAR, they might pray for that person and use that language, but the equivocation occurs when they load that language with something different than petition. They mean something different by it than petition. And we believe what they mean by it is something that's foreign to scripture. Mm-hmm. So it's actually an unbiblical form of prayer, 
of invoking God's power. And there are all sorts of religious traditions that have prayer as part of the practice. And they seek to invoke the power of God to change things in the world. And there are different ways to think about what that is. We think that what uh, Narfolk have done is they've invested the concept of prayer, which should be a biblical concept of petition with different meaning that you can actually associate with other religious traditions where you're invoking God's power and you're using it as a kind of lever mm. to make things happen in the world as if you're harnessing divine power. And so the equivocation is in the change up in the use of the term in, a, in, in what you presume to be a shared context right. of understanding. But because the language is, is the same, that's no guarantee that the context of understanding really is the same. Yeah.